and uh, and we'll get started today. So welcome everybody. Good morning. Thank you, Gail, so much. I'm very excited to be here this morning, although I am in Michigan, so we're a little bit closer to lunch here, um, and I see some of my fellow Michigan peeps, so I'm happy to see you today, and we're kind of having like a Pacific Northwest day here in Michigan, um, like it's foggy and misty outside and like kind of unseasonably warm for us, so even though I'm in Michigan, I feel like I'm there with you in Oregon today. Sounds like you've been here before. Yes, I have. I have. I've been so lucky to be there before. Well, so I hope you can come back. <laughs> I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. So let's get started. I'm very, very excited to uh, be talking about push in services today. Um, and this is a presentation that um, if you are working directly with students, either as a teacher or a therapist, um, if you are coaching others um, in the schools or an administrator, I hope you have something you'll be able to take away from this today. Um, and like Gail said, we are going to focus specifically on our youngest students. That is where most of my experience comes from. Um, but I, again, hopefully have some, some nuggets of information that even if you work with older students that you'll be able to take away today. So we'll, we'll get right into it. So a little bit about me. Um, as of two weeks ago, I now have to say I'm a former school SLP and AAC consultant um, right in the middle of Michigan. And I spent 10 years uh, supporting early childhood special education classrooms, as well as GSRP inclusion classrooms. So for us in Michigan, that's Great Start Readiness Program preschool classrooms. Uh, but I recently accepted a position at our local university um, as a fixed term faculty doing AAC evaluations. So I will be um, kind of shifting my gears from the therapy and implementation of AAC to AAC evaluations. And, and I'm very excited about that. Um, I also own a part-time private practice, Stepping Stone Speech Therapy, and um, all of my clients are AAC users. We do in-home therapy, and that's a wonderful opportunity to work on um, implementing AAC in-home routines with families. So that's another um, cool opportunity that I have each week to, to go do that. So that's kind of my experience and what I'm bringing to the table today. I'm kind of jealous. Sounds like we get lots of high quality contact with lots of interesting kids. I do. I really do. And yes, especially the in-home therapy um, is, you know, the piece that I really wanted to work on as a school therapist, but just didn't, you know, you are working on so many other things. And um, that home piece of it is so, so much of a struggle in the schools. So it's been a very cool opportunity to get that piece of it. Um, you can see my disclosures there. Our, today, we are going to um, talk a little bit about why push-in is so effective and why we advocate for that. We're going to talk about ways to push in, um, whether you are doing that yourself or, like I said, we're, you're coaching others. I'm going to give you some of um, the, the benefits and then also some of my favorite activities. We're going to talk about how to take data during push-in sessions, which is a, a piece of it that seems to be a hold up for a lot of people of why, what's, presenting, what's preventing them from starting to push in. And then, of course, we'll have our question and answer and the case study. So why push in services? We're gonna talk through three different areas of, of why we're pushing in, why this is an effective therapy model that we really should be following for our young AAC users. And the first, as we know as school personnel, we are governed by IDEA and that LRE, least restrictive environment. This is kind of the umbrella of all the things we do. Um, we always are considering least restrictive environment and um, I love this book, the SLP's Handbook to Inclusive School Practices. They have a beautiful quote talking about that services need to be occurring in the space where the activity, routine, skill, or need naturally occurs. 
And as you know, for our AAC users, that is in the classroom. It's where their peers are, it's where their teachers are, it's where, um, you know, their learning is occurring. And so why wouldn't we want to teach them that skill right in that environment? Um, there are reasons that, you know, I, I still would pull a student out of that environment if I needed to. But for the last four or five years of my time in the schools, I started to do push in as uh, the rule and pull out as the exception. And so that was a big mindset shift for me and for my coworkers. Um, but it turned out to be a really beautiful thing. The other piece of this, um, I used to work closely with our special education monitor. She was also our early childhood supervisor. And she asked the therapists that worked with the classroom um, to not only think about the classroom in terms of least restrictive environment, but also our space in terms of LRE. So, you know, a lot of us work really hard in the schools to make our offices these like nice, beautiful places that are sensory friendly, um, they're welcoming to students. Um, and that's wonderful that we do that if, if we are lucky enough to have a space, right, to call our own. Um, but when you think about it in terms of LRE, our office space really is a more restrictive environment. And when you have students that are already in a self-contained classroom, they're already away from their general education peers. They might have adaptive curriculum already. We're already not at that gold standard of LRE. And now I'm taking them to an even more restrictive environment. So it's not to say our offices are bad places or that we should never take students there. We shouldn't work hard to make them welcoming spaces. But when you do start to think about your office as a more restrictive environment, it does help to change your mindset about it. And then of course the bonus, if you're only working in the classroom doing push-in services, that generaliz generalization of skills starts from day one. And that's one of the best benefits of push-in therapy. We talk about transitions a lot for our students and I think this one is mostly common sense, but the students, when we have young AAC users, those students typically do not have a lot of functional communication yet. Um, and so when we think about transitions, these students are probably the students that are least likely able to handle those transitions. And now we're adding in another transition down to our office or down to wherever we work, simply for the fact that that's how we do things or we've always done it that way. So it's just another layer to think about of, is this a necessary transition? Do I need to be pulling this student away and adding another transition to their day? And then finally, the biggest, biggest reason I advocate for push-in services is visibility. Um, so first of all, the visibility of you as a therapist or a service provider, um, or if you're a teacher, the, vis the visibility of your service providers in your classroom. Um, when I switched completely to push in services, you know, I started doing every minute of speech therapy in the classroom. And so that meant that that teacher and those paraprofessionals saw the good, the bad, and the ugly of my speech therapy, right? They saw when things were going really well, and we were having all that beautiful AAC magic that we know can happen. And they also saw when I was not hitting it with those kids, I was not following their lead, things were going completely wrong. And when you give yourself that vulnerability to allow others to see that, it really is a bonding experience for you and those staff members. And they learn to trust you, they learn to relate to you. And they also learn that you are a person that is in there with them, kind of in the trenches. You're willing to do this with them. And so I'm willing to do this as well. So building that rapport with that teachers by pushing in is huge. And it's one of the reasons I think that, you know, I have been successful in getting school teams on board with AAC devices. They see me doing it. It's not as scary because they've seen me doing it in the good times and the bad times. Um, and, and you need those people on your team, right? So Robin McWilliam is the author of Routines-Based Early Intervention. Um, wonderful, wonderful content there if you're interested in learning more. But one of the quotes 
um, is all of the intervention occurs between visits. And they're talking about um, more of the early on home visits and things like that, that we should be coaching parents um, and coaching other service providers. But I think that is a beautiful quote for the classroom too, that I hope that all of my intervention would happen between my visits to that classroom, that they, they've seen me do it and I've taught them well enough that that intervention will continue even when I'm not in that classroom. The other beautiful thing about visibility of you being right there in the classroom is that other st students are seeing what you're doing. They're eager to be communication partners. And especially when we have young students, they think it's the coolest thing um, to see you using a device or a core board in the classroom and they're very eager to join. So they get to see you do that, which is really amazing. And then also just seeing AAC as a normal part of their classroom routine. I think is a, an amazing thing in terms of inclusion and building a community where modes of communication, any mode of communication is accepted. So when you go in there and you're modeling AAC, you're doing that beautiful speech therapy and aided language input um, and other students see you doing that as a normal part of the day, not something that just happens once in a while. Um, they see AAC as a normal thing, as just a different mode of communication. And then when, you know, say that student goes out into the community and sees an AAC user, and that's just something that they've seen and they know, and, and that's really powerful. So hopefully we've built that foundation of, you know, pushing is a good thing. We should be doing it, we should be advocating, but now the big chunk of it is how. And this is where a lot of my coworkers get caught up of like, okay, I'm convinced, I understand this is something I should be doing, but tell me how to do that. Tell me how to push in and be an effective um, service provider. Tell me how to be an effective teacher while I'm allowing someone to push into my classroom. So we're really gonna talk through that. So a lot of people choose to push in in either one, or one of two times. A lot of people in early childhood choose to push in during free choice or play. And we're not going to spend time focusing on that today because most people, I think, kind of get that of like, I go in, I play, I either set up my own play center or I just join the child's play. Um, so most people, I think, kind of can grasp that pretty quickly with practice. The thing I have seen my colleagues struggle more with is pushing in during group instruction, either large group or small group instruction. So that's what we're going to focus on today in terms of keys to being a great group facilitator. Um, and then some of my favorite activities to um, get some great language opportunities during those group times. So keys to great group instruction, we're going to go through each of these quickly, um, but having a mix of activities, being prepared, engagement opportunities, and then most of all, just having fun. So being prepared. When we talk about push in and doing play-based therapy, one of the good things about play-based therapy and child-led therapies, you don't have to lesson plan, right? So I got very used to just kind of winging it and going into the classroom and being like, all right, what are we doing today? And then when I started leading these groups, I had to kind of go back and say, oh no, I need a lesson plan. I need activities. I need to be consistent. So how do I do that? Um, so something that was very successful um, was, you know, starting my large group or small group in the same way that the teacher starts that large group or small group. So whether you're a therapist or a teacher, thinking about how do I um, give a verbal or visual cue to the students that large group or small group is starting. And um, if the teacher already has that, how can I be consistent? So a hello song, a greeting, you know, there's wonderful hello songs on YouTube that we would sing and dance together to, to let them know. We also would do the cute like eyes are watching, ears are listening songs to kind of get our body ready for a large group. So if you as a therapist can be consistent with that, you're already going to be a step ahead. We always would have our materials near us, and I'll show you the cart that we would use um, on the next slide, but we don't want to be scrambling for materials. You need to have whatever you need for that group for the whole group time near you, especially in early childhood. There is nothing that's going to lose their attention faster than you like digging through a drawer trying to find something. Um, I will say you can model some good language when you can't find something like, oh, not find, not here. Um, but I, you know, there's nothing that will lose their attention faster than scrambling for something you can't find. And then using some visuals to keep yourself and your staff on task. That's been huge for us. 
the biggest thing I always take away from, from this one is that even when you're prepared, even I'm sure I know Linda, you said you've supported students for 42 years, which is amazing. Um, but even if you have 42 years of experience or, or however many years of experience, it's very normal to go and lead a large group and have everything go wrong and have, um, yes, I see Linda nodding her head there. <laughs> so there are times that you will prepare, 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 and things will go wrong and this is normal. So please remember that if you are pushing in a newbie to pushing in and in group instruction that things will go wrong. And, and I think maybe that means you're doing it right sometimes. So here's the cart that we used for our group time. It's a rolling cart from Ikea. We used the, um, a foam board on the front so the students don't see all of the um, things that we shove into the shelves behind it. Um, and so we have our universal core board on the front there and we've made it so the icons can rip off. Um, and then, yeah, everything that we need, all of our visuals, all of our manipulatives for activities are just right in that cart. And that has been a great system for us. The next thing about group instruction is engagement opportunities, or um, we also call these opportunities to respond. So Grand Valley State University is a university here in Michigan. And um, about six years ago now, they did a study with early childhood classrooms on opportunities to respond. And um, they kind of were looking at like, what is the key points of engagement that you need in early childhood group instruction to keep those kids on task? And so they, they had some really interesting things they found, and we'll go over that um, on the next slide. Opportunities to respond are just um, active moments in your group instruction where the kids are responding to you or they're invited to do something. So this is not um, active listening where they're just sitting back and they're engaged in listening. This is where the students are actually doing something during instruction. So think of, you know, if you are singing a song and the students are imitating the motions in the song, if you are reading a book and you're leaving out a word for the students to kind of answer in chorus back to you. So these, these are opportunities to respond. The students need to be actively doing something during the circle time or during the, the group instruction. So the researchers found that five to seven engagement opportunities per minute was the ideal amount, okay? And that is difficult, right? Five to seven engagement opportunities per minute. That means that every 10 seconds as a group instructor, you are providing an opportunity for the students to respond. Now this was, you know, in early childhood classrooms, both special education and general education classrooms. So, as someone who has led a lot of large groups, I can say that, that that is difficult every 10 seconds to be figuring out a way for them to, for your students to respond back to you or be actively involved. Um, but it's not impossible and it, it, it's a great thing to aim for. However, when we think about our AAC users and we think about these kids that are learning language systems, they're learning language, um, we know that a fast paced circle is not always the best opportunity for them to be an engaged active listener. So there are definitely some things that we had to do. We took this information, we said, yes, we love that. We love the opportunities to respond. We love that active piece of this, but how are we going to kind of um, accommodate this for our AAC users? So the things that we did to, um, to make this kind of strategy work for us, for our AAC users, before an activity started, if we were working on specific, a specific core word or specific fringe vocabulary during that, we would always start the activity by showing um, how to navigate to that vocabulary on their device. So for example, you know, today in ECSE, we're reading brown bear, brown bear, brown bear has a ton of color words. So let's all look together on our device and, and navigate to our colors page. Okay. So before we read the book, before we have those opportunities to respond, we are going to navigate to those pages. We're not going to make that child stay on those pages if they don't want to. We're not going to force that communication, but we're going to kind of pre-teach that navigation if they would like to use it. 
We also, if we're doing a song or activity um, that has motions, we always practice those first. So we're gonna sing a song today and in this song, we're gonna stand up and sit down um, five times. So let's practice standing up and sitting down. So that student, if that student does have motor planning difficulties, they have that motor plan a few times before um, the pressure is on during that activity. We used a lot of repetitive language activities. And I think a lot of people, you know, have this, they, they know this as a good thing of using repetitive language. Um, is a good thing for early childhood and for all of our students really. Um, and then we also weren't afraid to use the same activity over and over again. We would often get bored with it before the kids would and that was okay. Um, so just giving them the, the language during that activity and then doing that activity, um, you know, five or six days in a row and, and really letting them just kind of like revel in the fact that they knew the language that went with that activity. And we just kind of had to live in the space where we balanced that wait time and the pace of activities. Sometimes we had to wait. Sometimes we had an ace, a, a, a little one that was formulating a message on their device. And that, you know, that takes away that five to seven engagement opportunities for other students, but that's okay because we want to honor that communication and give that wait time. The next thing we talk about in group instruction is mixing activities. Um, this is, is kind of an easy one and most people kind of do this naturally, but if you are leading a group that's gonna have more than one activity, think about a movement activity versus a sitting activity, um, an activity that's focused up on the board versus something that's focused on the students or focused on something that's in your hand. So mixing up those activities. So this is where I'm going to share my favorite activities. Um, we did, in the last time I did this presentation, um, we had people kind of write down a list of all of their favorite activities. Um, and so this is kind of the early childhood list that we came up with for group instruction. Lots of good things on there. The only one I want to kind of call out is the early social games by Laura Mize. Laura Mize is a wonderful pediatric speech language pathologist, and um, she is really big on the early social games. She has a whole book um, called Teach Me to Play With You. And um, so early social games were a big, big thing, especially for our um, young students with autism. And so that's something that's a wonderful, wonderful um, space to go. If you are interested in learning more about that is Laura Mize's website. So, um, so mixing activities. So here are my favorite activities to kind of mix it up at circle time, get great language opportunities for our AAC users. So the first one is shared reading with core. Um, and I know a lot of people are familiar with this. This was a great opportunity for us to bring in those repetitive books in early childhood um, and really just model that core vocabulary um, throughout that book and give lots of opportunities for those students to hear that repetitive vocabulary and then also respond or comment um, with what they thought about the book. So, you know, this is a great literacy activity. One thing that we did um, is that anytime we were uh, preparing for a new book is that the teacher or myself would go through and write the core words on sticky notes. Um, just so as we turn the page, you can see in my um, who said peep book that pink sticky note says who and not so we know what language we're modeling as we turn the page. Um, and then I think my collection of like magic wands and silly fun pointers has grown over the years and it's grown even from this picture. But anytime that you are somewhere that you can see, uh, you know, the dollar store or somewhere where they have a cool light up wand or magic wand um, to pick that up because that always seemed to keep that kid's engagement as the keep, keep the kid's engagement as well when they got to use something fun to go um, touch the words or they saw me using it. I love these activities um, to do what's in the box or feed the animal. Um, these are awesome early childhood activities to do at large group. Um, so what's in the box, I'm just easy as it sounds, you're pulling things out of the box and allowing the students to name them, tell things about them. You're giving clues about what's in the box using core vocabulary or fringe vocabulary. Um, 
And a lot of times that would, was a great opportunity to work on that seasonal vocabulary as well. So with the holidays coming up, we might have, um, you know, a present in the box, a snowflake, an ornament, things like that. Um, and so then on the opposite end of that, we would also do feed the animal. And so that same, whatever same manipulatives we were using, we were just feeding whatever, um, you know, whatever animal you can see the one is like a, a oatmeal tube that we put a frog face on. And the other one is a penguin trash can that we found at the dollar store. Um, so feeding those um, manipulatives to animals and, you know, we would make the penguin like pretend to chomp on their hand and they would love it and ask for more or do it again. Um, so that these two activities have been, um, I think I've probably done what's in the box and feed the animal more times than I could ever um, count in my career in just 10 years. Um, but they're just wonderful activities that work really well. Pink Cat Games is another amazing um, website that a lot of teachers I know use to put up on their um, whiteboard or their smart board. It does require a subscription. And the last time I had checked, I believe it was $39 a month but they're wonderful open-ended games and you can really target a lot of language in them. Um, so the little farm scene that you see, there is a farm animal who's hiding behind one of the hay bales and you have to choose which hay bale. And then um, when you pick the right one, it magically appears and all the kids really get excited about that. And then they also have, um, similar to what we were doing, they have feed the animal games. Um, so you can see the unicorn, you get to feed them lots of silly things. The unicorn grows bigger and bigger and bigger. And then at the end, um, something silly happens depending on what animal that you're feeding. Um, and they have lots of you know, seasonal games or just games that have to do with child's interests, you know, fire trucks and, um, police cars, construction trucks, things like that. So just lots of really amazing open-ended games there that we love to use during circle time. The last one that we really enjoyed doing during group instruction and pushed in um, was doing shared writing or we called it build a book. And um, so this is something that, you know, we would choose a, a core word phrase we would write it out on our, um, our big white paper, and then each child would have an opportunity to come up and fill in that phrase. Um, so the one you see on the, the large piece of paper, um, we were reading um, From Head to Toe by Eric Carle, and the repetitive phrase is, I can do it. So we were talking about the things that our bodies can do. So each child got to come up, they got to see us write their name and some of the students would help us write their name that working on those pre-writing skills, we would, for, we'll, excuse me, work on that core word or that core word phrase. And then they would get to tell us something that they can do. And so we would have some sort of visual or some sort of manipulatives that they could choose from to help them finish that phrase. Um, we would also then take a picture during that group activity and then make a book out of it. So that for early childhood and shared writing, that's kind of where we stopped and shared writing I know has more steps to it um, that are really wonderful. So that's kind of the piece of it that we took. And, um, and then, yeah, we would make those books and put them in the classroom library. And those books stayed out all year and the kids loved them. They loved to see themselves in the book. And then we got lots and lots and lots of core word practice um, just by going through those books again. So that, that was an awesome one. I, I love the build a book activity. The last key to great group instruction I had to put, you know, we, we just got done with deer season here in Michigan. So um, I had to add this one in there, but just having fun. Like I talked about, you know, when you are pushing into the classroom, people are going to see you make mistakes. They're going to see you stumble over your words. Um, and, and so that having fun with it, being able to um, just kind of be silly and understand that that might be embarrassing and that's okay. Um, is another really great key to understand about pushing in or being a, a great group instruct instructor. Small group instruction. When we talk about small group, this is another place that people often push in. Um, and a lot of people 
um, are like, well, what, what do I do for small group then? And I really don't have any other, um, anything other to offer, anything else to offer other than we would do whatever activity that we had done at large group and just adapt it to small group. And most days our large and small group were back to back. So we would be dismissed from large group to go right to table time. And whatever um, we would pick one large group activity that then we would just facilitate in a smaller group. So again, that repeated language exposure, the students were exposed to the language at large group. We had all those wonderful yeah. opportunities to respond. And now they have um, even more opportunities to respond or practice that language. Um, Kim, I'm sorry, I'm sorry to interrupt, but in large group, did you have all the kids in the classroom in your large groups? Yes, yes, we typically did. There was a, um, a couple years around that COVID time that we did split circle. Um, so half of the students would be in large group and the other half would be in a, um, would be doing tables and then we would swap. Um, but for most of the large group instruction, yes, we had all the students there. And that was whether or not they were AAC users? Yes. Great, thank you. Just mm -hmm. needed clarification. Yeah. Um, so yeah, instead of using, um, you know, the big smart board, we're using small whiteboards or felt boards, um, getting that, um, those visuals or manipulatives kind of right up in front of them was always a key for us. And then we at each table in our classrooms were lucky to have um, iPads with AAC systems. So every table would have an AAC system that the staff was modeling on. Um, so that was really great for our students. Again, even if those students were AAC users or not, AAC was being used during that table time. A lot of people um, get overwhelmed when they, they hear all that and like, I have to come up with all of these activities and I have to teach it in front of people. Um, and so sometimes all of that feels overwhelming. And so when, when people tell me that, this is kind of where I, I cue them to start. And that is just go into the classroom and start with a lesson on inclusion and talk about communication and the different modes of communication and ways that people communicate. And this for early childhood is the best book that I know of, um, or, or the book, I guess, that has worked for me and that um, the Lucas the Lion loves the tiny talker. So you can see it's one of the books where like, as you're reading through the book, it prompts you which button to push. And then that little blue part actually is removable. And that's fun because then the kids can kind of take it and use it and our peers can take it and use it without taking a student's AAC system to practice using it. Um, so it just talks through Lucas the Lion um, being frustrated that he can't use his voice and so his mom gets him a, the tiny talker and then he's able to use it to communicate. So we kind of pair that with a lesson about all the different ways people communicate um, and that's been a great kind of gateway in. Um, so if you are a teacher that is just hoping to have push in services, this might be a great thing to ask for. Or if you're a provider that wants to start doing this, this is also a great place to start um, to kind of bring to your teachers of this is something I would like to start doing. Data collection. I'm going to just briefly share how I did my data collection um, because this is quite a hang up for a lot of people. Um, so this is how I did it. Um, it worked for me and, and it got approved by my special ed monitor, which was important, um, but certainly is not the only way to do it. So when I started pushing in, I definitely had to rethink the way I was writing my IEP goals. Um, and so this is kind of the, the way we went for our early AAC users, our baseline data, um, we would, use Kathleen Quill's communication function checklist. Um, and so it's broken down into, um, can the student make requests in different areas? Is the student using social language in different areas? Are they negating and are they commenting? Um, and so there's different areas that fall into each of those four main areas. So we would take that baseline data, you know, how are they asking for, for food or drink? How are they asking for a preferred toy? How are they greeting peers? Um, how are they indicating they don't like something? 
it's a really great checklist that breaks that down in, in each area. So then my objectives would just become um, each of those four main areas of requesting, socializing, negating, and commenting, okay? So I always, um, my go-to, unless I really, really have, have something to tell me otherwise, I always am gonna write that objective that they'll be able to do it independently because that's gonna be my goal in a year, that they're gonna be able to make a request independently. They're gonna be able to, use social language independently, okay? And you know, in the schools, we have to add a lot of times that quantitative piece of it. So whatever percentage I felt would be appropriate for that student, then I would add in that objective as well. So then um, all of my students had um, a data rubric and I would keep these in a folder and they were on my clipboard. They would go right in with me as I was doing group instruction. And so you can see on the left column are each of those four areas that I was looking at and some of the skills I was looking at in those areas. And then each day I was just saying how independently was the, the student able to perform that skill. So I was pretty easily after group instruction, either myself able to fill this out or get feedback from staff members that had worked with that student of, hey, we had a lot of opportunities to request during this, um, during this activity today. Were they able to do that on their own or were you kind of having to um, give them cues? You know, were you pointing to the area on the device where their words might be? Um, were you kind of having to move the device closer to them? Um, so we would talk through what kind of cueing that child needed. And then um, each day we would kind of give that skill a rating of nope, even though there were lots and lots of opportunities to request today, they didn't do it today and that's okay, but that's gonna be a zero. Um, or yeah, they requested independently every time there was an opportunity. So we're gonna give them a four um, for independent. And so then I have these beautiful um, fours, threes, twos, ones, whatever. And at the end of the marking period or the semester, whenever I'm providing that data, I am able to give a percentage. And it typically is a percentage that makes makes sense to parents of you know when they have opportunities to ask for things, they are doing that on their own about 70% of the time. The other 30% we are having to um, kind of prompt them or um, give them some sort of other cue. And, and that has been good data for most parents. And it's been good, like I said, for our monitor that she gets those numbers that she really loves. So I did link that specific communication rubric is from Teachers Pay Teachers. Um, so it's linked on the slides there. Okay, so questions or comments. I had not been looking at the chat, um, but I would love to know what questions or comments that you have. Um, I have been looking at the chat and your presentation has been so rich that, that we haven't had too many questions, but I think now's a good time um, for those, for, for people to ask them questions and you can feel free to unmute yourself. I, I have a comment. Um, I actually agree. Yeah, I'll put my put my video back on here. that when I'm in the, I'm in OT and when I'm in the classroom, that I, I really like doing pushing for whatever it is that I do so that staff can see what I do. Yes. And um, every now and then you get staff that sort of test you. Well, you do it. <laughs> you ask me to do, you do it. And it just makes it, it just the example of you being there. Um, I also think that, you know, that you smell also, you're not better than staff, that they yeah. sort of go along and 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 participate. So I really like doing things right right in the classroom and explaining what I'm doing while I'm doing it so that staff see and hear and they have an example of what to what to follow. And I'm really careful about 
not being too hard on staff if they're not doing it perfectly afterwards. If they're in the ballpark, we're fine because else or else you'll lose them. Yes. So that's my comment. Thank you for sharing. I I absolutely agree. And I definitely, you know, you have those staff members that they're like, all right, well, this is not going well, you do it. <laughs> and it is, um, you know, I think that sometimes when they do throw you to the wolves, like out of their frustration, and then you can and show them like, here's something that would work, or here's what I'm going to try. And maybe I'm going to fail miserably too. But yeah, like you said, I'm, I'm here with you. I'm going to try it too. And I'm going to fail too. And now let's talk about what we both did and what we both could be doing better. And yeah, I, I appreciate you sharing that. Thank you. It's also an opportunity to, to talk about, you know, what your goal is um, in, in that activity. Bruce, I see you have your hand up. I, I do. And uh, so when I started in the profession in schools, the, the teacher would shoo the kid to the door and then expect me to take <laughs> them out. And then the expression was, is he fixed? Yes. Now, as you would bring them back. So I'm a physical therapist and my profession has wrestled with, we didn't, wasn't called push in at that time, but we've wrestled with providing services that are directed in the classroom rather than in a separate area. And we've made a lot of progress, but I will tell you that fistfights almost arose at some of the conferences as that transition was being made and people thought that doing a consultation, doing services in the classroom were against the whole spirit of, of what we were supposed to be doing. And we still run into this occasionally when a district hires a hospital therapist to come in. So my, my question for you is how, I mean, I, I started talking with speech therapists about, about this change in service and they were extremely resistant to doing it initially. Are you finding any buy-in with your colleagues or is there a lot of push back? Do they still want to pull the kid and work on our tick? Yeah. Um, I, you know, I work in a district that has 25 speech therapists and there, when I left, there was two of us that really were, that were doing push in, um, full time. And I think that, like I said, there's a lot of people who want to do it and they, know it's good and they know you know it's it's coming that like our administrators are starting to want this um but they're just so hesitant because it is what we've always done we've always pulled and you know i'm in my environment i have control over what happens here um no one else sees if i make a mistake um and so i think that for, I know at least for my colleagues, that's why so many of them are hesitant is just that, um, you know, I, I don't know how to manage this and I'm so overwhelmed by what I do have to manage that this is just another step to, that's too much right now. Um, so I do think, you know, the two of us that were, what, what I feel we're doing it successfully, really try to coach our peers and, and talk through that of, um, you know, like, let's take some baby steps. Like, why don't you just start during free choice play time or an, if you know it's an older classroom, like an unstructured time in the classroom, let's start there. The thought of being in front of people leading that group instruction is, is very scary for people. Um, and that's something that I think for me has just always I, I don't mind that. That's always been a natural part of my personality. But for a lot of people, that's a very hard thing for them to overcome. And that's that's what gets them, is that piece of it of like, I'm going to be in front of other people. What if other people see me make mistakes? Um, and so that's that's the part I feel like we've really had to coach our colleagues through. But yeah, we're, we're still getting a lot of resistance from them. Alyssa, I see in the chat that you said, in your um, agency, you're having lots of conversations about medical versus social education models of therapy. Can you tell us any more about um, those conversations? Yeah, that was more of a, a recommendation, um, not necessarily something that I'm oh. seeing here at our district on a day-to-day -day basis. I think that um, there's we have a fairly large um, 
group of SLPs, maybe 35 or 40. So there's probably a little bit of everything across the spectrum <laughs> in terms of what's going, what's happening out in the actual schools. Um, but there are a ton of resources and blog posts and infographics about the difference between the medical model and the educational model of, of therapy. So speech, OTPT, um, and how really our, our main eligibility guidelines in the schools rely upon there being an educational impact. And that's very different from the medical model. So using that as your tie-in, like we are here to support their education. We are here to support them while they're here in schools. And that means that we need to support them in their education where they're actually being educated and not necessarily pulling them out away from that to work on these, you know, maybe splinter skills or or fill in these gaps that then then have no relationship to what they're doing at school. So having those, um, finding those resources and using other people's words have been helpful for me in the past explaining that, like, here's this handout, here are all these websites that go through and describe that. Mm -hmm. Might be helpful for you as a PT as well. You know, I, I wanna um, just, compliment Carolyn on that first set of slides that you did about why to do push-in therapy. What are the benefits of it? As I was listening to you, I knew that we had some OTs and PTs on the call also. And, and I was thinking, wow, everybody needs this list. It's just such a nice, concise, good reasons to do um, push-in therapy. And we've we're, uh, we've got some of the members of the choir here with us today who are really um, moving in that direction. But I think that list is um, is very valuable. And I see Devin saying, I love your quote that learning happens between our visits. Um, it's a great uh, explanation that consultation is valuable. Mm -hmm. um, I know you have a case study for us. So uh, we, we've got about uh, 15 minutes left and I'm hoping that maybe we can hear the case study and then maybe have some more conversation if we have time. Absolutely, um, I do. So the unfortunate thing about the timing of me leaving my school position in the last two weeks is that I no longer have permissions to share the videos that went with my case study. So I do apologize about that. So um, I, you know, I I always appreciate when I can see videos and see things in action. Um, and and like I said, that was. Um, the the unfortunate piece of it of like maybe I could stay in this job two more weeks so I could have the permission <laughs> to share with you all um but I could not so we're just going to talk through the case study today but I do have um so just to give you some background I saw a student um, who had was just under three and had just received a medical diagnosis of autism and her parents were very hesitant about starting services um, and um, so they only agreed to services one time a week for 45 minutes. Um, but we knew that this student eventually would probably um, be a student who is a good fit for our early childhood special ed classroom. And so they agreed that they would bring her into me since I would be the speech therapist supporting her eventually in the classroom. But obviously one time a week for 45 minutes is not ideal. Um, you know, in, in any sense, it's definitely more of that medical model. And, but that is what, that's kind of what got her parents um, foot in the door. So that's what we agreed to. Um, she had less than five verbal words and one ASL sign and had lots of behaviors of frustration, just not being understood and not getting wants and needs met. Um, so our, our therapy in that time, um, very much child-led play-based, uh, for all of our students in the classroom, we follow a floor time model of DIR floor time. So we worked very, very hard on joining joint attention and engagement in those early weeks um, and worked on modeling with a low tech core board. So that's kind of where our therapy started. So even um, even then, her parents, as hesitant as they, as they had been, her parents were very, very good at 
follow through. So um, I introduced the core board in the first session. They left that session with three laminated core boards. And within two weeks, we're sending me videos of them trying to do it at home. So I think that's, you know, sometimes rare that you get that follow through pretty immediately from parents, but they were really, really motivated to communicate with her and, um, and wanted to help. So um, the, the therapy that parents were doing and the strategies that we were implementing at home was being, was successful. They were starting to see some success at home, but progress with me was pretty minimal, um, right? It was only once a week. We had that transition piece of it that she had to transition to a completely different building, be with a completely different person that she wasn't used to. Um, and so progress with me during my time um, was, was pretty minimal. So we knew that something had to change and, and her parents started to really see that too. Um, and so by our summer session, uh, she was, um, she joined our classroom. So our classroom in the summer is three days a week for three and a half hours. Um, and so that was really great that the, her parents, you know, saw that need. And we talked about like, we're working in the classroom, we're gonna make this a consistent and um, comfortable place for her. And then all of her services are gonna come right to her in that classroom. And that was a big um, piece of that to get their buy-in. So I worked in the classroom with her um, during that summer session and then into the next school year. So then we went to five days a week, that three and a half hours. During the summer session, we were able to introduce high-tech AAC. We went with TD Snap and she, um, um, so we always start with a seven by seven grid unless we have reason to, to think otherwise. And within, um, so, and then obviously because we push in and the classroom staff is seeing us do all of that work, that classroom staff um, does have some additional training, but they are just, they're great modelers. Um, they see other people modeling and they follow through with it. So she had therapists that were modeling for her quite a bit during the day. And then also um, her teacher and parapros were modeling language on that high-tech device for her. She also is a student that um, she did have pretty immediate success once that high-tech device was implemented. On the first day, she was using core and fringe vocabulary to make requests. Um, you know, so we don't, that's a piece of it that we don't always get. Sometimes we work really, really hard for a long, long time to get that um, success. And she understood that AAC device pretty immediately that that was a communication tool for her. Um, so when we saw that immediate success with the high tech device, we did start to um, start the evaluation process to get her, um, her own device through their insurance. That's something that her parents really wanted. But because we were pushing in and lots of people were seeing the work that we were doing with her, um, I feel like her skills, we easily were able to target skills in a lot of different contexts with a lot of different people. So her AAC, AAC system from the beginning, um, she was used to using it a lot of different places with a lot of different people, which was really huge. So looking at this student today, Today, she's enrolled in a full day inclusion classroom, which has seven students with IEPs and nine students without. Um, and her AAC system is a huge piece of her um, being able to uh, communicate and participate in that classroom. So her SLP continues to push into the classroom during free choice. And she also does large group instruction. She does it a little bit less um, than we were doing it in ECSE, but she's still getting that large group modeling time. Her um, peers absolutely love seeing her speech pathologist work with her and her peers are very interested. So the SLP often talks about how, you know, like sometimes it's really hard because I'm trying to work with her and one other student, but like eight other students wanna come see what we're doing. Um, which is amazing, but also kind of hard to manage at times. Um, so she's working through that for sure. Um, but her communication uh, partners are learning to be great communication partners because they're seeing that consistently throughout the week. 
um, the staff, because they're seeing those strategies uh, by the speech therapist in the classroom, they are always able to kind of adapt what they're doing based on what's working. So there's no need to kind of wait for like the next student study team meeting to talk through strategies or things like that. They're seeing it in real time. And so I'm, I'm happy to say that in just under um, kind of, I guess a little bit over a year, like a year and two months, the student is very independent in using their communication device. Uh, she uses it mostly to request and comment, but that SLP is continuing to work on expanding those communication functions. So I have to believe that um, because of the push in services the student has received, the, the generaliz generalization of that AAC device um, has been constant. She's never had to go from using it in one enclosed environment and then be all of a sudden expected to use it somewhere different. It's always just been part of her environment. Um, it's been part of her environment for all of her peers and staff as well. And so I, I really kind of attribute the success that she's been able to have um, in, a, in a large part to those push-in services. We, of course, have a wonderful supportive family as well and a school staff that um, you know has kind of always been on board. But I think that is a, a big piece of it. So that's my my case study um, and I am, have been so happy to share with you today um, some knowledge about push-in services and I hope that you know you are continue to be on board that you can continue to kind of coach your peers to be on board as well um, and like I said I hope that no matter where you are that you've been able to take something away today um, and yeah I've, I've just really enjoyed spending my time with you today. So I'm happy to, to answer more questions or have more discussion, um, but that is all I have. Thank you so much, Carolyn. This was um, a really valuable presentation in, in lots of different ways. Um, so I'm gonna be quiet for just a minute and see who else has comments or questions. I was curious, Carolyn, um, how much trouble or success have you had with uh, administration buy-in for cushion? I know that very often that seems to be a roadblock for a lot of people. Yeah, I have been lucky to have great administrative support. Um, and, but I, I know that certainly is not the case for everyone. So my early childhood administrator, um, was a, was a former ECSE teacher and she was, you know, way back in the eighties the and nineties was having her schools, everyone push into her classroom. Um, and so she is, I did not have to get her on board when I went to her and said, this is what I wanted to do. Uh, she was an advocate for me right from the beginning. And even, you know, when I kind of said like, I need to tweak my IEP times to make this work, or I need to amend these IEPs to make it work. She was very supportive. So that is a piece that I think a, a barrier that I have not had luckily, but I know a lot of other people have. And um, I do think, you know, going to an administrator and perhaps asking, is this something I can do once or twice a month? Or is this something that I can try in one classroom? And then, um, you know, getting some feedback from the staff and the teachers in that classroom. There, I don't know of anyone that once they start pushing in, they're getting negative feedback about it. Normally when people start pushing in, the, the staff is very excited. Um, and it, it seems to, people seem to set up good systems and have good things in place. So I do think like if you can just get that permission to, to try, you're going to then have that ball rolling of, of this is a good thing. But I do think that, you know, the fact that I could just go in and say like, I'm going to start pushing in in all my classrooms. And she was just on board with that was, um, was pretty amazing. <laughs> I have to, I have to admit, I had a great administrator uh, that was supportive. Alyssa, I see you have your hand up. Yes, thank you. I was going to say that um, as far as administration go, they should know, or if you're talking with general education administration, you might need to remind them that services are driven by the IEP. 
So if it's in the IEP that that service is being provided within the general education setting, then that's what they need to support. And so it might be tricky if a student moves into your district and it has special education setting on the IEP. Um, but if the team has decided that during the evaluation and during the IEP process, that that's where that service needs to happen, then they, I mean, they can't really say that that's not okay. <laughs> so that's one thing. It is frustrating though, if you started a new school or you started a new program and all of the IEPs are written as special education setting. Um, but I would go into, let's say if they're in a self-contained classroom part of the day, they're already in a special education setting. So if that's where they're at, then you're not, don't necessarily need to pull them out again from that special education classroom. Um, and that would still support that. I think that's such a great point, Alyssa. I think like going back to that least restrictive environment is, is the piece of it for administrators. Like when you can pull back in IDEA and back in special ed law that, you know, you with pushing, you really do have it on your side. Like, why am I pulling the student out of a restrictive environment? Um, I, I, like I said, I'm lucky I didn't have to advocate that way, but I can see that being a very strong piece of it that you could bring to the table. Thank you for sharing. Linda, you got your hand up. Yeah, I just I wanted to kind of really um, your champion. I, I love all your ideas. Um, and I know from the ODE point of perspective, we are um, encouraging inclusion. So this is wonderful. But more importantly, from the time I was a director, I was the director in Silver Falls for 12 years. And we did a lot of inclusion. And what happened, the more and more we did inclusion, it just became a part of the culture of the school. It became a part of the culture of the community. Um, when our special ed kids were out in the community, the kids knew them, and it was the kids um, carrying on the mission that, yeah, Johnny's in my class and he's special. And then I'm now I'm moving into sixth grade. Well, where's Johnny? And so what mm -hmm. I found is the peers became the biggest advocates for our students with the most significant needs. So, um, yeah. We, from the time, I remember my first year teaching, my classroom was down the street around the block and wasn't even on the same, <laughs> same building. And so just seeing our special ed kids included in the classrooms is where they need to be. Um, if we want them to be included for a lifetime, we got to start down in those preschool years. So thank you for all your work and your diligence in this. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Absolutely. And I, yes, it's been really cool to support those classrooms in early childhood because you can just like when we get the opportunity to teach them so young and like really talk about inclusion and talk about disabilities and just make it normal from the time they're three and four years old it's so cool to just see and you know that's something I, I really try to champion like I have a five-year-old and um, he had the opportunity to be in the inclusion classroom last year and so it was just like yeah, um, so my my buddy Derek he uses an iPad to talk and like that's that's totally normal. Whereas like five years ago that would have been like, well, like I don't know how to talk to Derek. Like you know what you know. So I, it's just very cool to get to work in inclusion in early childhood and um, yes, that's it's very exciting to see. And most of the time when I go in, like I am used to kind of being the cool person that goes in and like I get to bring my fun toys, but. Um, I have quickly found in my inclusion classrooms that like the other kids are way more cool than I am. <laughs> the best thing I can do is just like teach another kid to do it and then they can facilitate it so much better than I can. <laughs> okay, well, that's a wonderful way to end. Um, thank you so much for being with us today, Carolyn. And, and um, I look forward to the next context that we have with you. Um, here in Oregon. Um, our time is up, so we're going to stop the recording. And um, if, if you have time, we always just um, stay on as long as possible.